In Southeast Asia, American forces were engaged in Vietnam. In Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union suppressed a democratic rebellion in Czechoslovakia. Across the globe, the superpowers were locked in a deadly serious and highly strategic game of military superiority. Nowhere were the stakes higher than underwater, where nuclear-laden submarines could approach an enemy's shores undetected. Pointing the location of such deadly naval power was paramount. Both sides considered that the very survival of the world was at stake. Admiral Carlisle Trost is a former member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We were doing everything we could at that time to find out as much as we could about each other, operating in close proximity on occasion, uh, looking at each other through satellites, uh, through electronic means, and doing everything we could to ascertain the other person's capability, the other side's capability, in the event that that single most likely adversary took military action. At the time, the Soviets had the largest submarine fleet in the world, and the U.S. had a top-secret system to track them. We had at the time in place in the Pacific uh, a series of listening devices, uh, of magnetic devices, uh, that were undersea uh, arrays set out to pinpoint the location of virtually every submarine uh, or every ship in the entire Pacific Ocean. The U.S. Navy's surveillance system was called SOSUS and cost nearly a billion dollars. It was the largest spy network in the world. It was a vast array of underwater microphones, called hydrophones, placed on the ocean floor. On March the 8th, 1968, a Soviet ballistic missile submarine moved within striking range of Hawaii. The US Navy nervously watched and listened to her every move. Named the K-129, she was one of the Soviet elite. The diesel submarine was loaded with Serb-class nuclear missiles, high-tech launching equipment, and secret Soviet codebooks. In short, she was ready for war. Intelligence officers were reportedly recording the actual sounds of the K-129 when suddenly something went wrong. Americans later claimed that the submarine was recharging her main batteries when events spun out of control.
there was probably a hydrogen leak, which somehow ignited. And it must have been a, a horrifying moment for, for everybody on that ship when the explosion rattled through the, the boat and started a, a descent that, from which there was no recovery. lay in over 500 meters of water, almost five kilometers down. Her 13 officers and 85 crew members were dead. The Soviet military had no idea what happened or where their prize sub was. but the U.S. did. It was a target of such great opportunity that minds had to start thinking about how can we get this boat? How can we recover this boat? Initially, America waited patiently to see what the Russians would do first. Valentin Betz was a Soviet rear admiral at the time. They were all my comrades. The commander of the sub was my ex-first officer, and I knew all the sailors well. Admiral Betz led a search team across the Pacific to hunt for the lost submarine. I have to tell you, the search expedition was a nerve-wracking affair. I didn't sleep for several days hoping I would find the boat. There was no hope. At the time, the Soviets lacked the sophisticated sonar equipment to locate a vessel at such a depth. Their effort was doomed. For them, the K-129 was a mystery of the deep. In Moscow, nothing was said about the incident. The silence haunted the families and shipmates of the lost sailors. It was uh, the prize of all time, from an intelligence standpoint. Uh, what they could recover were the Soviet uh, missiles themselves. Uh, they could recover the ship's internal guidance system. They could recover the ship's internal navigation system and they could recover the nuclear-tipped torpedoes. Almost immediately, a daring plan was hatched to raise the K-129. President Nixon, his top advisors, the Navy, the CIA, wrestled over the complexity and risk of the operation. Viktor Suhodrev was Leonid Brezhnev's interpreter at the time, a position that gave him rare insight into America's leadership. One can't help being really uh, struck by how vitally important it must have seemed to the American administration, not just the intelligence community, but on a broader scale, to raise that submarine and look into its contents. The mission was named the Jennifer Project. And under the direction of Richard Helms, 
the CIA took control. The people involved in that, I mean, thinking about going down three miles to the bottom of the ocean uh, and bringing up a submarine and somehow doing it in secret and, and all of the nuances and things that go with that, uh, they must have looked at each other and thought, you know, I'm 007. I mean, I mean, this is a James Bond movie. This, this is not real world. In the late 60s, raising a 2,350-ton submarine from the ocean floor was the stuff of science fiction. But there was one man in America known to turn dreams into reality. He was the all-American hero, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was an American industrialist, film producer, and master pilot. He was also one of the most powerful men in the world. For decades, Hughes' companies were leaders in electronics, aircraft design, and oil exploration, technologies that would later join together in raising the Soviet submarine. Michael Drosnin wrote a biography on this amazing character. He was the Bill Gates or the Ted Turner of his age, but a lot more interesting. He held in his hands so many of the levers of power. He had sole control of one of the top ten defense contractors. He owned completely the drill bit that was needed to drill every oil well in the entire world. Howard Hughes made billions, and much of his fortune came from secret government connections. But that relationship led to public investigations. Now, Mr. Hughes, I'm asking you what your answer was. And we're not going to have this bickering back and forth. Hughes did not like the attention or the embarrassment. And it is unfair to place me in the position of having my integrity questioned. He began to withdraw from public life, taking himself even deeper into the most clandestine corners of the government. For the CIA, linking Hughes to the Jennifer Project was a very shrewd move. Sixty-five million years ago, an entire species was wiped out by a single meteorite. The next bombardment is long overdue. Could we be next? Three minutes to impact, Sunday at 9 on Discovery Channel. Right, I shall be giving you your presents this year with a touch of magic. A Sainsbury's Aromatherapy Kit for Auntie Vi. Pour in your bath, dear, not down your throat. For Grand from Sainsbury's, the Titanic video. Remember, dear, you are on it. And a Hydro Sauce bath set for Cousin Raquel. For Sharon, a Santa Face bag. For Young Paul, a Sainsbury's chocolate drawing kit. And for Uncle Jack, <laughs> Belgian Mint Truffle. Belgian Mint. Would you like a rabbit? Sainsbury's. Hundreds of great Christmas gifts from as little as 99p. The cat. Perfectly adapted to hunt for fresher food. The owner. Perfectly adapted to open it. New Whiskers Singles, foil pack, for freshness. Hello, yesterday we were more than happy with stereo sound. Today, this television is equipped with a new sound generation, Virtual Dolby Surround. When this Virtual Dolby 
the round is integrated in the TV. It's as though the sound is coming from all directions. So, the mate, Thompson, with virtual Dolby surround technology. The sound that surrounds you. Hmm. Can I help? It's just so much. No problem. What do you like? Entertainment, news, travel. Travel? Okay, just click on the travel channel then. Hmm. Oh, it's fancy barley. Just click there and then... Click on barley, obviously. Hmm. At AOL, we're here seven days a week, giving you free help on how to use the internet. And we speak English, not jargon. Well done. Hi, Connie. Hi, Katie. How's he doing? I think it's all beginning to click. Oh, great. Come on, Dad, I've got email to send. In a minute. And how are you up to do? All right, all right. AOL, so easy to use. No wonder we're number one. people deserve special chocolates. Wouldn't you and the people on your Christmas list be thrilled with a new Cellnet phone? Well, here's our brand new offer just in time for Christmas. Every new Cellnet customer who joins by the 31st of December and who joins our free first program receives free quarterly refunds on calls. And in April, we'll send you a bonus check for £50 free for every phone you order. All you have to do is call 0800 40 50 30 and join by the 31st of December. Four inventions helped win World War II. None were weapons. Find out about these unsung heroes on Wheels and Keels every Thursday at 9 on Discovery Channel. What was the biggest and most secretive effort since America's rush to build the atomic bomb during World War II? Howard Hughes' companies joined forces on the Jennifer Project. Across America, leading corporations helped design the technologies to achieve the impossible. In less than two years after the K129 sank, a top secret ship emerges at Sun Shipbuilding and Dry Dock in Pennsylvania. Named the Hughes Glomar Explorer, she was to be the headquarters for the entire mission. Designed by a company called Global Marine, she was the most advanced concept vessel ever conceived. The Hughes Glomar Explorer operated like a giant floating oil rig. Huge steel pipes would link together and feed through her massive 23-story derrick. Once lowered into the sea, they would probe at depths never before attempted. Paul Atkinson was the chief executive officer at the Sun shipyard. Getting something off the bottom of the ocean of, of substantial weight and moving it up and lifting it and putting it someplace on the surface just seemed to me uh, to be a, a far step beyond that which we had gone before. What they designed for below the surface was mind-boggling. A monstrous claw over 45 meters long.
huge hydraulically driven arms would grab hold of the K129 to lift her up through five kilometers of ocean. If they succeeded, sections of the sub would be pulled into a giant hole carved deep into the hull of the ship. It was called the moon pool. Inside they would be able to dissect the captured submarine, concealed from the outside world. Spanning a period of six years, Thousands of people were involved in the secret planning. Amazingly, their effort went largely unnoticed. One of the really incredible aspects of the entire mission was that there was a cover story developed to cover any sightings of the ship, questions of the ship, sightings of modification of the ship or any of its equipment and that cover story stood up. The Hughes team proclaimed that all the special equipment was being designed for a bold new sea mining adventure. But what most of the world did not know was that during this time, Hughes himself had slipped into madness. Even the CIA did not fully know how bizarre he'd become. What the CIA was really doing was taking advantage of the Howard Hughes myth. And who was he really? A naked madman with his hair down to his ass, his fingernails 10 inches long, curled up in bizarre yellow corkscrewed, his toenails just as long. Never put on clothes. He kept his urine in mason jars stored in the closet. We're not talking about ordinary crazy. We're talking about the bull goose loony of all time with the biggest fortune in the world and a real power. In fact, the Hughes cover was so believable that other companies scrambled to launch their own deep sea mining adventures. By the summer of 1974, all the pieces for the secret mission finally came together in one place. As the Hughes Glomar Explorer loaded up for the mission ahead, the world took little notice. Six years after the K129 sank, the Cold War was still raging, and the stakes were just as high. Keep in mind that even six years later, those things are still out there on other platforms. Those missiles are out there. The technology for those missile warheads is likely to be embedded in other missile warheads that are at sea the communications capability, the code, code design capability. Yet right at this critical moment, as the secret ship was ready and waiting, danger loomed on the horizon. A short distance away from the dock, there was a burglary that blew the lid off the entire secret mission. Just after midnight, four thieves entered an old warehouse.
It was the Howard Hughes Communications Center. Every secret memo Howard Hughes ever wrote was inside. In addition to money, the thieves took many important company documents. And, to the horror of the CIA, the thieves got hold of a secret memo detailing America's plan to raise the K-129. Howard Hughes was involved in so much dirty business with so many different powerful organizations. People were afraid to touch this case. The secret that they feared was in the hands of unknown burglars who may have ties to the Mafia, the White House, the Russians. Everyone is terrified of what's in those stolen Howard Hughes documents. Ironically, just five days after the break-in, Nixon was in Moscow for historic peace talks with the Soviets. The leaders of the superpowers were there to sign the SALT II treaties, an attempt to limit the production of nuclear weapons. President Nixon must have wondered what action the Soviets would take if suddenly informed about the secret plan to raise the K-129. That summer, the pressure on Richard Nixon was tremendous. It was the height of the Watergate affair, and in less than two months, he would resign his office in disgrace. And now, because of a leak, a potentially deadly decision had to be made about continuing the CIA mission. And everybody was afraid that this might really and truly trigger a war. Not a limited scale war. This, this could be the, the situation that would cause the buttons to get pushed. New CIA director William Colby pressed for moving the operation forward. Somehow, somewhere, someone decided we're going to go ahead. Who that was, no one knows. But that person had to have had the guts of God. The executive order was given. And an anxious crew of 172 men headed out across the Pacific. They arrived at the site some 1,200 kilometers northwest of Hawaii on the 4th of July. The ship was loaded with some 600 lengths of 10-meter pipe. Together, they formed the 5-kilometer chain down to the submarine. Hidden deep within the ship was a secret control area the men called the Spook Room. Inside they would operate the giant claw, unseen from the crew above.
cameras were mounted above and below the ship so that the entire operation could be monitored and recorded by the CIA. As the first 18-meter section of pipe string was in place, they fed it down below into the moon pool. Waiting inside was the giant claw. Two massive doors rolled open below and the three-ton claw was on her way to the K129. They were exploring a new frontier. Uh, as, as different a frontier as going to the moon in the Apollo mission and the Mercury mission, uh, the same amount of, of care and technology uh, was involved. Tethering a free-floating ship to the deadweight wreckage of the submarine, five kilometers, the equivalent of three miles down, was a daring concept. If the ship had drifted during the link, she would have been torn to shreds. But the Glomar was designed with a revolutionary stabilizing system. The system was driven by giant thrusters, located fore and aft. Together they produced a force equal to 10 jumbo jets. The Glomar stayed on a fixed position, keeping within an area of 3 meters, which was an engineering first. Around the clock, men and machines worked in perfect unison. This constant process, once it starts, doesn't stop. And the noise of this process is, is huge. So all through the ship, day and night, uh, without cease, is the constant banging and the grinding and, and the shifting and the greers and, the, and the, the noise, just the mechanical noise of steel on steel as this long umbilical is stretched deeper and deeper into the ocean. In less than three days, the pipes plunged over 50,000 meters in depth. While the work was taking place, the Glomar was being watched. Soviet spy vessels were circling her perimeters. The men of the Glomar feared that the Soviets might take action at any moment. I run, I walk, I do everything. It's great. Modern medicine can prolong life like never before. But what price do we pay for... Thousand tons. Sent a shockwave up the pipes to the Glomar. Fortunately, the giant thrusters held, and the ship soon steadied. The K129 was slowly freed from her grave. Gradually, 
she rose through the deep. 60 meters, 150 meters, 1500. She was almost up four kilometers when, according to reports, something went terribly wrong. Several of the arms suddenly fractured. The sub's hull ripped apart. A one megaton nuclear warhead slid out of its launch tube. Fear gripped the crew as they envisioned the Glomar blowing sky-high in a huge mushroom cloud. But the warhead merely slipped quietly into the blackness. Several of the arms precariously clung to the submarine. Carefully, miraculously, she was guided into the moon pool. Years of elaborate preparation came down to a single moment. As expected, parts of the wreckage were radioactive, and a specially trained team began to gut the K-129. Whatever secrets they found were not passed on to the outside world. After 40 days on site, an exhausted crew made their way back to their California base. They arrived uh, as quietly as a cat stealing into a room. They, they weren't about to, to make a lot of noise. There were eyewitnesses who saw uh, trucks, for example, uh, pulling up to the ship and uh, materials being loaded in the trucks, you couldn't tell what it was, uh, and then the trucks drive off and the ship sits there. Under the cover of darkness, the convoy slipped away in all directions. What it carried was one of the most guarded secrets in the world. But news of the mission had started to leak out inside America. During the investigation of the Howard Hughes robbery, the press had caught wind of the true purpose of the Glomar. In a desperate move, CIA Director William Colby personally called many of America's top journalists. The revelations of the past few weeks have probably led many of you. It was an attempt to keep them from digging deeper into the story. Those revelations reflect things past. Journalist Jack Anderson was looking into the mission. I got a telephone call from Bill Colby urging me not to print the story. He said, uh, this is a matter of security. I said, come on, what kind of security are you talking about? Anderson expected Colby to be straight with him, but he wasn't. 
and Anderson was left in the dark. If I had known that uh, they were really trying to get their hands on some Soviet missiles, some Soviet nuclear missiles, uh, that would be a matter of secrecy, I would never run the story. Colby admitted that there was an operation, but he announced to the world that it had failed. The press would never know the truth. To protect the truth even further, the new president, Gerald Ford, issued an executive order that nothing else would be said about the project. But years later, Colby himself explained. I recommended to President Ford that, if, that he put out the order that everybody keep quiet. Nobody say anything official. Whatever the press was saying, that was their business. But no backgrounders, no, no explanations, nothing, just Shut up. Did the mission really fail as Colby proclaimed? Or was the story of failure simply part of a larger cover? I suspect it was an effort not to divulge any more than necessary about the degree of success of the operation so that the Soviet Union wouldn't know whether we had recovered an entire submarine, a critical portion of the submarine, or nothing at all. Uh, clearly, we recovered something. Good cover. Did the United States have some new authority in their diplomatic relations with the Soviets? If the Soviets themselves knew anything, they weren't saying. All I knew about the Glomar Explorer project was what I read in the uh, American press. Officially, there was no mention of it in the secret briefing books prepared for Brezhnev. And they contained every subject under the sun. But the official silence didn't keep the astonishing news from reaching the Soviet public. At Moscow airport, American press reports were smuggled in. They caught the eye of customs agent Irina Juravina. For her, the news was shocking and painful. Her husband had been the deputy captain of the K-129. Soviet naval officers were also left to speculate about the tragedy. Many believed that the K-129 sank as the result of a collision with an American submarine. My version is that the other submarine had been spying on the boat and was spying from Kamchatka and so it hit her and she sank quickly. The US Navy stuck to their account and officially denied the allegation. The ceremony will now begin. The closest the United States has ever come to acknowledging any contact with the K-129 was revealed in this secret CIA film, which was later shared with the Russians. During the operation, the bodies of six Soviet sailors were recovered. The US went to great lengths to rebury them in a traditional Soviet naval ceremony.
The CIA offered no further detail about the mission, and the Soviet government chose to put the whole episode behind them. Maybe it was something like an embarrassment for the Soviets. There were Soviet ships in the vicinity. We know that. Watching what was going on and being totally powerless and helpless. Knowing that they, the Soviets, could never match that kind of a fight. Whether America succeeded or failed in getting Soviet nuclear missiles, code books, and other secrets is still not known. But the mission itself demonstrated to the world the strength of resources available to the US at that time. But the facts remain, even in the failure story, that they went down, 17,500 feet of water, they successfully grappled onto a submarine, and they brought back at least a piece of it. By what I believe, they brought back all of it. Some saw the massive operation as a signal of the possible outcome of the Cold War. I'd say our ability to develop something like the Glomar Explorer with that capability probably demonstrates that we can compete as long as we need to and we can afford to do so without destroying our economy. They could not. They could not have both guns and butter, if you will. That fact was not lost on the Soviet leadership. Perhaps the full truth about the Jennifer Project will one day be disclosed. But for now, the story is still deemed a matter of national security. Next on Night Discovery, a history of the tank at war being...